Now you touched on the real estate market there. What's your view of the current situation and the outlook for the next uh, 12 months or so? Uh, is the bubble under control? I think the Chinese property market has already reached a turning point. Uh, not just the housing sales has come down, but um, housing price has also, you know, uh, falling uh, or, or in the you know in, in most of the cities in China, which in my view is uh, is good news. Good news in the sense that. After you know five six years, this continues to rise. We finally we see some kind of corrections, which uh, should be good positive in terms of the mid term long term development for the Chinese property market. Uh, but the key issue here is that you know whether this is going to the correction is going to be overshoot, i.e., to turn out to be a collapse in the total in the property market. I think the risk for that is f is, is pretty small. The reason being that you know the we already see the basically the you know, the monetary policy has already started to ease. Uh, so therefore, I think that indirectly will, should provide the flow for the slowdown in the, 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 in the property market. But more importantly, uh, particularly in the, in the majority of the, you know, third tier, second tier cities in China, the property price is still reasonable. So there's uh, less element of the bubble. So therefore, I think the, you know, a collapse in the property market in China in my view, this time around, probably is, is, is still kind of the unlikely. Now, prices are coming down. How much would you expect them to continue to fall, and over what time frame? But, you know, our research suggests that probably we are, we should be looking for uh, twenty to three percent, twenty to thirty percent of the uh, uh, decrease in the property price in the first tier cities. Uh, second tier city probably less. We're talking about probably ten to fifteen percent. Uh, over the next, you know, over the, over the course of the next six to nine months. Now, since the lending problems in Wenzhou, in particular, in the latter part of last year, many people have called for more interest rate uh, liberalisation. Uh, we haven't seen much uh, move from from <coughs> the government on this. Mm. Uh, you've said in the past that it's better to reform individual financial institutions before instituting a full scale interest uh, rate liberalization. Do, mm. do you still think that? Yes, I think the, my kind of argument uh, uh, based on, the, uh, uh, on two things. First of all, I think kind of the interest rate uh, market, in order to make the market oriented interest rate mechanisms work, you need individual financial players, financial banks, you know, financial companies, uh, to be able to price the credit risk rightly, yeah. So therefore, you know, you need first to make the individuals, you know, capable of to price the, you know, to right rightly price the credit risk. Uh, that's basically a precondition for you to have an interest rate liberalization. Uh, more importantly, I think the current global environment is not the best environment for interest rate liberalization in China. What's the ca current global environment? You know, Fed is now have a near, nearly zero kind of interest rate policy. ECB is also doing quantitative easing. So the whole world, the interest rate has been twisted. So now really the kind of the you know normal level of interest rate kind of the environment. So given this kind of environment, if China has become too aggressive in terms of the liberalize free up its own interest rate and you may end up with some kind of undesirable kind of the problems. So I think the, the timing probably is not the best, it's not the best for China to really to push forward for the interest rate uh, liberalization. Now just a final question. The offshore market appears to be showing that the RMB exchange rate uh, is pretty close to a long-term uh, equilibrium. What trends do you expect to see from the RMB in the future? I think the, you know, the one-side appreciation uh, story is over. Uh, starting from this year, RMB probably is going to enter a period of the two-way flexibility, uh, two-way vol volatility. Up to you know last year, China's trade surplus percent GDP has come already come down to less than two percent. So a two percent GDP trade surplus is more or less kind of it's not big issues, and it's more kind of the you know in a range of the balance trade balance kind of picture. So from this point of view, I think RMB is no longer undervalued. In other words, it's already coming to very, very close to its mark the equilibrium level of ex exchange rate. So therefore, there's no need for them to continue to appreciate. But there's also no need for them to depreciate. 
Chu Hong Bing, it's been enlightening to hear all your insights. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Join us again next time on On The Record. I'm Mark Dreyer.